All right, we have here kind of a unique sermon tonight. Had some brush to burn here, and I thought this might be kind of appropriate uh, setting for this sermon. I want to talk to you tonight about the sin of Sodom. Okay, there's a big debate right now about this thing of uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and a lot of people are saying, you know, what is right, what is wrong, you know, what do we believe, what does the Bible say, uh, is there a hate crime in talking about people's lifestyle, all this stuff. And uh, watch the sermon before you judge me, okay? Um, a lot of the people in the Sodomite community are very, very narrow-minded, very bigoted. Uh, they want to shut people down that they don't agree with. And that is absolutely op the opposite of what you supposedly stand for. And if you are going to try and false flag this video and uh, say I'm committing hate crime by what I'm about to say in this sermon, and you don't even watch the sermon, then uh, the Lord's going to have a problem with that. Okay. Um, I'm going to preach to you tonight what the Bible says. I'm not going to preach my opinions, my preferences. Um, I'm going to preach what the book says. All right. So what is the sin of Sodom? First, let's turn to Lamentations chapter 4. Going to need a King James Bible for this. Lamentations comes after the book of Jeremiah. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 5. And tonight I'm going to, because I have my fire going here, I'm going to have to be pausing periodically to stand up and move the fire around to keep it going because I have stuff to burn here, so... Yeah, I just have to bear witness, or bear with me, rather. I guess some could bear witness, too, but... Let me put some wood in here. All right, Lamentations chapter 4, verse 5. Okay, it says here, They that did feed delicately are desolate in the streets. They that were brought up in scarlet embrace dunghills. For the punishment of the iniquity of the daughter of my people is greater than the punishment of the sin of Sodom that was overthrown as in a moment, and no hands stayed on her. All right. So there is a sin that is unique to the city of Sodom. This sin, it doesn't say the sin of my people or the sin that most people get involved in or something. It's the sin of Sodom. Now the interesting thing here is three new perversions, I like to call them, new versions of the Bible. The 1984, the whole way through to the 2011 NIV, all the NIV editions in other words, the Living Bible and the TEV all remove the word sin. They're in Lamentations chapter 4, verse 6. Now, why would that be? Why would that be that they would take out a reference to the sin of Sodom? Interesting. Four uh, new versions say the punishment of Sodom. They don't say the sin. They say just the punishment of Sodom. Okay, these are the New Revised Standard Version, the English Standard Version, the Reader's Digest, and the RSV. Okay? Two Catholic Bibles say the penalty of Sodom, the New English Bible and the New American Bible. So again, they're, ta they're covering up this thing of the sin of Sodom. Very interesting. <clears throat> but these Bibles that I'm going to tell you here, these Bibles all say the sin of Sodom. The King James Version, the New King James Version, the Message, believe it or not, the 1610 Dewey Reams, the New World Translation, the New American Standard Version, the Berkeley Version, the American Standard Version, the Amplified, the Bible and American Translation, and the Modern Reader's Bible. And the Jerusalem Bible, which is another Catholic Bible, has changed sin to sins in the plural. That's not what the Bible says. Okay, your King James Bible says the sin of Sodom. Now, if you're using an NIV out there, let me ask you a question. This... Oh, the NIV is updated and all this other stuff. We're updating it, making sure it's 
in line with the most recent textual criticism and all this stuff, why is it that the NIV has had 27 years, uh, actually more than 27 years uh, now, from 1973 to um, 2013, that would be 30 years, uh, right? That'd be 30 years, wouldn't it? 1973 to 2013? Or would that be more than 30? The point is they've had, they've had quite a few, 40 years actually, they've had quite a few years to fix the reading in the NIV and they didn't do it. wonder why. Hmm. Interesting. But now let's talk about what this sin is. What is this sin of Sodom? Let me stir the fire around here. While I'm doing that, you can turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. It's been raining a lot here lately too. So, you know, I'm not able to do as many of my normal backdrop, you know, videos. Okay, we're back. Genesis chapter 10, verse 19 and 20. What is Sodom? Let's look about this. It says here, And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, as thou comest to Gerar, unto Geza, as thou goest unto Sodom and Gomorrah, and Adma and Zeboam, even unto Lasha. These are the sons of Ham, after their families, after their tongues, in their countries, and in their nations. So Sodom and Gomorrah, that city was a descendant of Ham. Okay? That's what the Bible says. So now you get an idea whereabouts that city was. It was like the whole Egyptian, the Arabian Peninsula, probably right around that area here. There's actually some good information on that later about the actual location of Sodom. We're going to talk about that as we continue. Now go to Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. It says here, Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begat Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran begat Lot. All right, and then it goes into there, how they married and things like that, and where they went and dwelt. So you have Abraham, um, is basically the uncle of Lot. Now go to Genesis chapter 12. Okay, Genesis chapter 12, verse 5. Okay, it says here, And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, and into the land, or into the plain of Moreh, and the Canaanite was then in the land. Okay, so they travel into the land of Canaan. Now, if you want to read down through uh, verses 7 through 20, we're not going to do that for sake of time, but basically Abram travels down to Egypt because there's a famine. He tells Pharaoh that Sarai is his sister, not his wife. Big mistake. And, you know, God sends a famine on Pharaoh, and until Pharaoh lets you know, says, hey, I haven't touched Sarai, you know, and he gives him, gives her back to Abraham. Okay. But uh, look at Genesis chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. It says here, And Abram went up out of Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. And he went on his journey from the south even to Bethel, unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai, under the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled then in the land. So you see there... They're down there in this area of the land of Canaan, basically. They kind of got out of bounds there a little bit. But here you have Abram and you have Lot, and they're basically saying, you know, we aren't going to be able to make it here together. I mean, if you have cattle, the cattle graze, and you get a whole bunch of cattle together, you're going to have a problem. So Abram says, hey, Lot, we need to split up here. Now look what happens. Uh, look at verse 8. And Abram said unto Lot, 
Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou wilt depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and look at this, pitched his tent toward Sodom. Hmm. You know, he saw those, that city out there, that Sodom, and he said, I'm going to pitch my tent towards that. And he looked down there, and you know, he's probably out there in the plain with all of his money and everything and all of his cattle and stuff. And he looks out there towards that city, and he's like, sounds like they're having a lot of fun down there in that city. I bet you I could get some good business contacts in that city. Hmm. Why would a rich man like me live out here in these plains when I could be in there in that city? Have one of those nice houses. That's what happened a lot. Lot went down into Sodom. But now look at verse 13. It says here, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Now, see, here's one of the problems. Because you see, modern day people that call themselves homosexual, but the Bible refers to them as Sodomites. We're going to see that as we continue this study. But they try to tell you that the sin of Sodom was actually in hospitality or something like this. You know, they, the people were not nice to the angels when they came, which we're going to see here in just a little bit. But if that's true, then why is it that here in Genesis chapter 13, verse 13, you know, 13 and 13? Hmm. Why is it then that it, the Bible says that they were sinners before the Lord exceedingly, before Lot even went in there? See? Now there's something going on here. There's a sin going on there that was there before Lot even went in, before the angels even came down. See, there was a specific sin that was going on there in Sodom. And we're going to find out what that was in this study. Okay, again, Genesis chapter 14, verses 1 through 10. We're not going to read it there, but pagan kings come and attack Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, the Sodomite kings basically run away and hide. And Abraham comes in and uh, gets back their goods and gets back Lot. They, these pagan kings, kings take Lot as well. And, you know, they basically want to pay the kings of Sodom come out of their hiding place. And they want to pay Abraham for, you know, basically whipping these pagan kings. And Abraham's like, no, I don't want your money. Which is a good thing to do, by the way. You know, when pagans like that try to give you money. But uh, you go through Genesis chapters 15 and 16, and these two chapters basically speak of Abram and his two sons, you know, uh, the one to his handmaid, his Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, which is Ishmael, and the other to his wife, Sarah, Sarai, you know, which is Isaac, which is the spirit there. And you can read about that in, in uh, Galatians. Uh, we read about that in the sermon from last week on the issue of kindreds and peoples and tongues and nations. All right, but uh, turn to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, verse 5. Here you have where Abram is now named Abraham. Okay, it says here, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So, again, if you saw last week's sermon, God makes a an everlasting covenant with Abraham and his seed, his descendants. Okay? That's very important to understand. Right? And that covenant is still there, by the way. But, uh, 
Now let's go to Genesis chapter 18, verse 20. Now we're going to see here about Sodom again. What's going on with the city of Sodom? Genesis chapter 18, verse 20 through 22. It says here, And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. Notice again that this sin is before the two angels come. Notice that. Get a hold of that. All right? Verse 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Okay, now, we're not going to read all these verses, um, but basically, verses 23 down through there um, to verse 33, Abraham basically tries to intervene here, and he says, God, you know, please don't destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because, of, you know, Lot's down there. He's trying to plead for his nephew. And God says, okay, you know, if you can find me, uh, you know, 30, or I guess he starts out with uh, 50 righteous, um, you know, and then it goes the whole way down to 10 righteous men. And, of course, he can't find 10 righteous men. All he can find is Lot in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Um, turn to Genesis chapter 19. Now we're going to actually get into the, this is the chapter here about Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, to, turn to Genesis chapter 19. I've got to stir the fire a little bit here. I'll be right back with you. All right, let's start reading here in Genesis chapter 19, verse 1. Okay, it says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold, now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house. And tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early, and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, and all the people from every quarter. Okay? Now, was there in hospitality there? No, Lot was very hospitable to him. So how could that have been the sin of Sodom? Especially when the sin of Sodom was mentioned before Lot even went in there. It doesn't make any sense. The sin was there. It was very grievous unto the Lord before the angels, before the angels even showed up. So that's a lie. Don't fall for that. Okay. Now what is the sin? Well, let's look at verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to, to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now read it through your King James Bible sometime. When somebody, when it says about knowing somebody, it means that there is a sexual relationship going on there. So these perverted men actually wanted to have fornication with two male angels. Notice it does not say the women of the city came out and wanted to know the angels. It says the men wanted to know these angels. What was the sin of Sodom? What is called today homosexuality. But what is called in your King James Bible, sodomy. But let's continue here. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do ye to them as it is good in your eyes, only unto these men do nothing. For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof, and they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came in to sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand, and pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut, the, shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. Now what happened there? Well, these perverts that were outside there, they wanted to have sexual relationships with the male angels that were in there. And Lot says, 
and, and look at this. Lot says, I have two daughters. I'll bring them out and you can have your way with them. Now see, if those guys were normal, if they were normally perverted, you know, they would have been like, hey, women, hey, that's great. They weren't interested in women. See, they were sodomites. It's the plain teaching of Scripture. All right. Now, if you go down there to verse 12, let's look at that. Let's read here verse 12 through 22. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place? For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. They laughed at him. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and sent him without the city. They sent him out of the city. Why? Because they were going to destroy it. Because of this sin. Verse 17, And it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, O not so, my Lord. Behold now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. This is the guy that used to live out in the plains. The guy that used to be, you know, take care of cattle and things. Now he's afraid to go out into the mountains because he's going to die. City living, you know. And uh, verse 20. Behold now, this city is near to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city, for, thou, for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou become thither. Uh, therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. Okay, now what happens here? The sun was risen upon the earth when, Lord, or when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. Remember that for later. That's going to be important. Brimstone and fire is what came down out of heaven to burn this wicked Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 25, And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. Okay? Let's see where I'm reading to here. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt okay she looked back to that wicked city she didn't want to leave it and she became a pillar of salt as a result you know and I'll be talking more about this as we continue okay now let's jump down to uh, verse 32 no wait I'm sorry now let's read here verse 27 and 28 and Abraham got up early, got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord, and he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the, the land of the plain, and behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. What was the reason? Because the sin there was very, very grievous before the Lord, and the sin was sodomy. All right? And the very fact of the matter is that God's wrath, you know, burned those cities to ashes. And, you know, people would say, well, you know, if I could see proof of that, then perhaps I'd believe the Bible. You know, I'd just have to see proof of that, right? Well, actually, there was a man named Ron Wyatt, and I do believe he discovered those cities back in the 1970s. And there are some videos out there that show his discoveries. Okay? And here's a couple pictures I'm going to show you these pictures here while I'm stirring the fire again. And you can see 
the remnants of buildings there, very, very clearly remnants of buildings that, you know, have been burned and they are still standing, but they're just solid ash now. It's really quite amazing. And of course here, now with these pictures, these are the, what they find all over that valley. They find these balls of sulfur, pure sulfur. And, you know, it's a very fascinating video, this thing from Ron Wyatt. And I understand Ron Wyatt has some issues. I understand he's, I think, Seventh-day Adventist or something like that. But, you know, the fact of the matter is his information I don't think has ever been refuted. And it's very, very incredible that these balls of sulfur actually were burning into solid rock. You can see the pictures there. Now turning your Bible to 2 Peter, the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2. You say, well, if these cities really have been discovered, then why isn't it in the textbooks? I mean, why aren't they teaching people that Sodom and Gomorrah was a real city? And right there, I mean, you can see the outlines of the buildings. It's, it's crazy. 2 Peter, chapter 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 6 says here, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an unsample unto those that after should live ungodly. That's why they don't want to teach it. You see, because if they taught, if they showed those pictures in your, in your public schooling, and they said, look at that city. That thing is still standing there, and it's all solid ash. And it's got little balls of sulfur all through that ash, all through solid rock and ash, those little balls of sulfur. See, that would be as an example, an ensample there to those that after should live ungodly. Those people that afterwards would live like the Sodomites. See, they don't want to do that. They want to cover it up. They want to tell you that homosexuality is a normal thing, that it's a lifestyle, that it's something that God made you that way. If God made those sodomites that way, then why did he burn them? It doesn't make any sense. Okay? But uh, let's read here verse 7, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. It says here, And delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. Conversation often in your King James Bible means behavior. Okay? For that righteous man dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Huh. Unlawful deeds. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Those sodomites were punished. But notice it says they're unlawful deeds. What was the law there that they violated? We're going to see about that. But first, let's go to Jude, the book of Jude right before Revelation, Jude chapter 1 and verse 7. Okay, it says here, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, going or giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh. So these relationships were strange, going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. You say, now wait a second. They got burned. And the fire went out. It left the city as, a, as ashes. How could that be eternal? Well, think about it. Did their burning stop when they burned up here on the earth? No. Those sodomites burned and then burned again when they hit hell. The fires of hell. Jump right in. Think about that thing. And, and see, the whole purpose of this sermon, you're saying, oh, this is hate speech. No, I'm doing this sermon trying, if you're a sodomite out there, if you are a homosexual out there, or have leanings that way, this sermon is to warn you. You see, the fires of hell, which will be thousands of times hotter than this, the fires of hell, you don't have to go there. The fires of hell were prepared for the devil and his angels. If you end up there, it would be a mistake, a great mistake. And I'm trying to tell you how to get out of that. All right? I'm not saying I'd like to find out where you are so we can come and kill you or something like that. No, 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 no. 
I'm telling you what the Bible says and telling you how to get out of that for eternity. That's so important for you to understand. Okay? <clears throat> now go to Leviticus. We're going to see why this, was an un why this sin is an unlawful act. Back in your Old Testament, people say, well, the Bible really doesn't clearly define it. Yes, it does. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, chapter 19. All right, you, you want a clear definition of what sodomy is in the Bible, what the sin is, and why it was unlawful? Let's look about this. Genesis chapter... Wait, did I have that written down wrong? Yes, Genesis chapter... Or I'm sorry, I'm all mixed up here. Leviticus chapter 18, not chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 22. Okay, it says here, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. You want a clearer definition than that? If you are having sexual relationships with a woman that's not your wife, that's fornication in the Bible. And the Bible says that's a sin, but an even greater sin, an abomination, is when two men get into bed and have sexual relations. And the same, the same thing goes too for women. We're going to see that as we continue here. All right. Sodomy is going after strange flesh. The strange flesh of two men or two women. That's what the Bible says. And see, if you have an issue with that, then your issue really isn't with me. It's with this book, this King James Bible. I didn't write this book. God wrote this book. So your issue is with the book and with the Lord. You better think about that. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 13. Okay, it says here, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. In the Old Testament, it was a crime punishable by death. Okay? It was very unlawful for two men to come together in an act of sodomy. Very, very, very wicked. And of course, you know, there used to be sodomy laws, anti-sodomy laws here in America. And now, of course, the sodomites are starting to turn those laws, you know, flip them and turn them against Christians. But if you speak against sodomy, that's a hate crime and you should go to jail for that or something. Which is absurd. Okay? I don't advocate execution of sodomites. And we're going to see why not in a little bit. Okay? Now the people who perform the sin of Sodom would forever more, after this point, they would be called sodomites in your King James Bible. Let's look about that. Deuteronomy chapter 23. Deuteronomy 23, verse 17. Okay, it says here, There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Okay, so a sodomite then is associated with men, the sons of Israel. Alright, turn next to 1 Kings chapter 14. First Kings chapter 14, verse 22. It says here, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places and images and groves on every high hill and under every green tree. So they're going and they're doing nature worship. They're basically becoming pagan. And look at this, verse 24. And there were also sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So, paganism and sodomy go hand in hand. Alright? In other words, you don't 
go into sodomy when you're getting close to the Lord. No, when a nation becomes pagan, when a nation goes after other gods and they start to worship these false gods, sodomy shows up. Very interesting. Hmm. Now look at uh, chapter 15, 1 Kings chapter 15, verse 11. It says here, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He kicked the Sodomites out. You see, when Sodomites come into a nation, they defile that nation, and God has to judge it. And so when you kick the Sodomites out, God says, okay, I won't judge the nation now. Hmm. But again, you see the thing there of the idols in the land and the Sodomites. The two are connected. Idol worship and sodomy. Interesting. Now look at 1 Kings chapter 22. 1 Kings chapter 22. First Kings 22, verse 45 and 46. Okay, it says here, Now the rest of the acts of Jehoshaphat and his might that he showed and how he warred, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? Look at this, verse 46. And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. So there was a couple of them left, and the son there of King Asa said, Out, get out. Now, why would that be substantial? Okay, and again, you know, okay, the sin of Sodom was in hospitality. Then, how do you identify these Sodomites or these people that are inhospitable and are being kicked out of the land? Come on now, you're grasping at straws if that's what you're trying to say. Sodomy is a sin of man laying with man as he does with womankind. It's a sexual sin. That's what's going on there. I mean, anybody that reads the Bible, the King James Bible, is going to come up to this conclusion. All right? Now turn to 2 Kings chapter 23. 2 Kings 23, verse 7. And check this one out. It says here, And he break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. Hmm. So these Sodomites were actually living right beside the temple, God's temple, the house of the Lord. Huh. Isn't that interesting? You see, they were trying to get in and mess up the worship there. Just like a lot of the Sodomites are trying to do right now. Trying to get into church buildings and force them to perform weddings and force them to be okay with their sin. Very interesting. Now, just give me a minute here. i got to tend to the fire again. All right, we're back. Um, now, what does the New Testament say? Because a lot of people say, well, the Old Testament's back there in the Old Testament. God was different, you know. And, and uh, what does the New Testament say? Let's look about that. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. You see, you might be able to duck some of the stuff in the Old Testament. I mean, not really, but, you know, you can get around that thing by saying, well, it was in the Old Testament, you know, and, and things have changed. You know, we're not under the law anymore. But uh, that doesn't work because of this. Romans chapter 1, verse 25. We'll start reading here. It says, Who changed the truth of God into a lie. Plenty of people doing that today. And worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burn in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is acceptable. That's not what it says. Um, an alternative lifestyle. No. Working that which is unseemly. That's sin, folks. 
and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. In other words, when they get all these weird diseases and stuff like that, venereal diseases and AIDS and things like that, well, that's the recompense. That's what they're paid back for. That's what the Bible says. See, I'm not espousing hate here. I'm reading what the Bible says and what God says, what Almighty God says. And if you don't want to end up in a fire like this for all of eternity, in the fires of hell, you'll submit yourself to what God's book says. Not me, okay? Not King James Video Ministries, not my ministry, not any other thing. You'll submit yourself to the Word of God, the written Word of God. All right? But continuing here, verse 28, And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. See that one there? Another little jab at the sodomites. Implacable, unmerciful. Now look at verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So you see you're condemned there too, by the way, if you watch things like television or movies where they're showing the sodomite lifestyle and saying it's good, it's wonderful, it's clean. You shouldn't be doing that as a Christian. The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's very important that you get that, that you understand that. All right, extremely important. All right, but you say, well, see, death penalty for sodomites, right? Is that what it says? Well, if that was true, then you'd have people that are backbiters. You'd have to put them to death. Haters of God, despite, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents. Oh, boy. And if you go up there to the other one, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, people that go and gossip behind other people's backs, you'd have to put all those people to death. Okay? It doesn't say that they should be put to death. It says they are worthy of death. I'm here to tell you something, brethren. We're all worthy of death. If you're a sodomite out there, you're worthy of death. But guess what? That sin that you are committing, and it is a sin, the Bible says the sin of Sodom. If you're a sodomite, you are in sin. But here's the good news. Jesus Christ came to die for sinners. He said, I'm not to come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, you don't have to be executed. And I know, I know you can go back and you can talk about what the evil Christians in the past have done and whatever else, most of which are Catholics or Calvinists, you know, really. But the fact of the matter is, a real Bible-believing Christian would not put a sodomite to death. All right? They would witness to him. Tell him, hey, you're a sinner. You're on your way to hell. I'm trying to warn you what the Bible says. All right? This Westboro Baptist Church stuff, that, that cult out there, those people are Calvinists. That's why they say God hates fags and stuff like that. Fag is not a Bible term. That's why I try to eliminate that word from my vocabulary. I try not to say faggot or queer or, you know, whatever. The Bible word is sodomite. You see, that's what's really going on there. And that's why if you are guilty of sodomy, you better get that thing, you better repent of that, you better turn from that sin and turn to Jesus Christ as your only hope for salvation. Not because of what Brian Denlinger says, but because of what this book says. This King James Bible has been around for 402 years now. And God has done tremendous, amazing things with this book. And by the way, if you were saying, well, King James was a sodomite. No, he wasn't. King James was married. He had eight children. And those accus accusations that he was sodomite or gay, you know, those accusations came out 20 years after King James died. King James was not a sodomite. King James wrote openly condemning the, the sin of homosexuality. He openly wrote against it. He wasn't a sodomite. 
All right. Very important to understand that. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Okay, it says here, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. What's an effeminate? Somebody who's effeminate? Why would that sin be judged in the Bible? Is God talking about women? How could God be talking about women? Why would God condemn a woman for being feminine? He's not talking about that. He's talking about sodomites. When you're a sodomite and you're going around and you're acting fruity, when you're acting feminine, effeminate, God's wrath is upon you. Okay? Very, very serious business. You say, well then, again, I'm being condemned. But look at verse 11. Verse 11, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Did you know that there are sodomites that have gotten saved? Absolutely. Praise the Lord for them. I praise the Lord for them. And you say, well, I'm a Christian, but I'm still a sodomite. Ah, uh, no, sorry. Nope. You're not going to continue in a sin that God says is very grievous, is very wicked, is very sinful, that is horrible, horrible before God. You're not going to continue in that thing when you get saved. You're not going to have this perpetual lifestyle of sodomy after you become a Christian. Not going to happen. Notice that Paul there says, such were some of you. He makes a very clear distinction there that they were that way and now they're not. They're not continuing in that lifestyle. Don't give me that. Don't tell me that you can just continue in that, that lifestyle of sodomy. I don't believe that. Sorry. You know, and I've had, I've had contact with young men. You know, I don't think I've had any young women yet that have been guilty of the sin of sodomy. But young men that said, I was messing around in sodomy. I was in that sin. And I'm done with it now. And I praise the Lord for that. I really do. But if you are saying that you are a sodomite Christian, I'm sorry, I don't believe that. That sin has a very, very wicked thing in the Bible. There's, there's a very serious judgment from God on that sin, that sin of Sodom. All right? You've got to stay away from that thing. You say, but science has proved that sodomy is, is, is we're born with that, right? Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6 gives you a warning about something, and a lot of the modern Bible versions have taken this thing out. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 20 and 21. It says here, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Hmm. Science. You mean somebody might say that science has proven that sodomy is not a choice? It's the way you're born. Yeah, you can make science say whatever you want nowadays. You know, a lot of these professors are sodomites themselves, are sodomite friendly, and so they say, well, we've done the research. Sure, sure you have. Sure you have. How are you going to prove that somebody was born a certain way? Say, a gay gene or something like this. Come on, come on. That stuff is phony science. All right, God who created heaven and earth and this world is created. I mean, come on. This world happened by chance, random chance of evolution. Yeah, right. This world was created. It's so obvious to anybody that has any intelligence at all. God created this earth, and he wrote a book to men, and in the book he says, the sin of Sodom. Man shall not lay with mankind. It is abomination. Crystal clear. Absolutely crystal clear, friend. There's no way to get around this thing. But you see, what happens when you go into this science falsely so-called? Look, look at verse 21. Which some professing have erred concerning the faith. 
Grace be with thee. Amen. If you want to be saved, you're going to have to understand that you cannot be a sodomite. And if modern day science says that your lifestyle is okay and that you were born that way and everything else, it's not your choice, you need to abandon that science because that science is going to land you in the lake of fire for all of eternity. You will err concerning the faith. Okay? I don't want that for you. The Bible doesn't want it for you. The Bible gives you a chance to repent of that sin that you are involved with. Turn next to Titus. Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1 verses 15 and 16 says, Unto the pure all things are pure. Now look at this. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure. Alright? And I've seen that thing with sodomy. Sodomites oftentimes will just do whatever they can to get off. Excuse me for being blunt, but I'm just being going to be straight with you. They'll do all kinds of weird, bizarre sex acts and things like that. There was a man in Germany years ago that ate his gay partner. Why? It was a thrill. Normal sodomite, you know, normal, just practices of sodomy weren't enough anymore. See, sodomy is perversion. And if you study the thing out, I mean, I had a, I had a brother that was actually a fire alarm inspector, and he said that there was an apartment complex that had a bunch of sodomites living there, a sodomite couple. They were in trouble all the time. Domestic disputes, you know having problems all the time. Why? It's perversion. It's not supposed to work. And isn't it interesting too that when you have a sodomite couple, one of them is always going to act more effeminate than the other? Isn't that something? Even if you have two men, one's going to act more like a woman than the other. They can't escape that relationship that God has created that's between a man and a woman. You get two women, one of them is going to be a little bit more of a man, you know, than the other one. Why? They can't escape God's design. God's pattern. See? But look at this. Let's continue here. Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. You have to defile your conscience to be a sodomite. Verse 16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient, and unto every good work reprobate. Hmm. Sounds like the different descriptions of sodomy that we've been reading here in the King James Bible. Abominable, disobedient, reprobate. Those are all descriptions that God has for you if you're into the sin of sodomy. You need to understand that. You're not going to duck it. Okay, what you have to do if you want to continue in your lifestyle, is you have to persecute people like me. You have to hate this book here, this King James Bible. You can't use this book. This book condemns you. See? It just doesn't work. Now, I'm going to tend to the fire one more time here, and then we're going to have the conclusion of this sermon. Be right back with you. All right, back here with you again. So what is the conclusion of this matter? Well, I actually had somebody write this in a comment. I thought it was really good, so I'm going to include it in this sermon. Turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 3 through 8. You say, Brian, I, I don't think you've made a case here. I'm sorry. I'm just going to do what I want. Okay. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? If you don't believe this book, does that get rid of the book? Now let's, let's, let's look at this next verse. This is very significant. God forbid, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written... Written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. I'm judging you right now because of the written record right here. But if our unrighteousness 
commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather, as we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Let us do evil that good may come. Let us pass hate crime laws so that we can have tolerance. Put people like me in prison. Shut off my channel from YouTube. See, if you do that, I'm going to tell you right now, evil's going to come into your life. If you shut down the Bible-believing Christians from YouTube, if you shut down and silence us, God's wrath is going to come. You know, there was this world's worst tornado here in Oklahoma, I believe it was, in uh, May of this year. Worst tornado in history. It came exactly one day after a gay pride rally. Isn't that something? And you see, just think about this gay movement for a minute. The gay pride movement. First of all, they take the King James Bible word gay, okay, which means happy. It means good. It's, it's, it's a good, positive word. The sodomites have taken God's word there, and they've corrupted God's word. And then they say, we have pride when the Bible condemns pride as a sin, every reference to pride in the King James Bible is a reference to sin. So they say, we stole your word, God. We took it. We took the word gay and applied it to ourselves. And then we're proud in that. And we're going to symbolize our sin with a rainbow. The rainbow is God's symbol that he will not judge the world again with a worldwide flood. How vile, how blasphemous. And if you want to have proof of what I'm saying to you, and you say, I don't believe the Bible, I don't believe you, Brian, okay, have a gay pride rally in your town and see what happens. See what the Lord does. You say, what's the conclusion of the matter? L-G-B-T. You say, oh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Let God be true. As it is written, if you are a sodomite, your issue is with this book. Your issue is not really with me. I preach the book. That's all there is to it. And if you silence me, it's because you have a problem with the book. You can shoot me. You can put me in prison. You can torture me. You can do whatever you want. But you aren't going to get rid of this book. This book has got your number, and I'm here to warn you. I don't want you to go to a place like that. I don't want you to go to hell. That's why I'm warning you. I love you enough to tell you the truth. If I was a liar, like a lot of the scientists out there, and a lot of the politicians, and a lot of the spokesmen and things for the sodomite rallies and things, you know, I'd tell you that your lifestyle was normal. I'd say that God loves you the way you are, and I'd be a liar like all those other people. But you see, I love you enough to tell you the truth and tell you, you better repent. You better get out of that system quick. You know, if I was back there in Sodom, I'd have gone out to those Sodomites and said, you better repent. You better repent. Judgment's coming. You're going to burn. You're going to burn. I don't want you to burn. God doesn't want you to burn. He's giving you a chance. Those angels could have taken Lot out of there just like that. But they didn't. They said, if you have any brothers, any sons, any sons-in-laws, anybody here that you can warn to get out before the judgment comes, before the fire comes, tell them, warn them. They were given a chance to repent. They didn't take it. And what happened? God rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and burned them. And the cities are still there today for you to see. They're still there. I'm trying to warn you. I'm trying to get you out of that system. You cannot be saved and be a sodomite. It's as simple as that. It is a grievous sin, much more grievous than almost anything else in, in the entire Bible outside of bestiality. And isn't it interesting that here in America now they're passing laws for 
people that want to have an sex with animals. Bestiality. What's going on? America is becoming a pagan nation, and so the sodomites are coming out of the woodwork. If you silence me, as I said, you can silence me. You can silence other preachers like me. You can burn these Bibles. This King James Bible. You can burn it. You can pretend that your lifestyle is normal and acceptable and that God loves you. But you can't get rid of what this book says. You can't get rid of the fact that this book condemns you to hell. And I know that you're going to try and persecute the Christians. I know the sodomite movement is going to try and shut us down, try and shut us up. It's going to happen. I don't know how long it's going to be till this stuff comes into, into play, until people like me are silenced. But when you do, just remember this sermon. Remember the fact that I tried to warn you. Remember someday when you were standing at the great white throne judgment before you're cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. Remember that Brian Denlinger warned you. Brian Denlinger told you you needed to repent of that sin. Brian Denlinger told you the way out. The way out is get away from the sin of sodomy and come to Jesus Christ as the dirty sinner that you are, just like I had to do one day. I never was involved in sodomy, but I had plenty of other sins. And I came to God as a sinner. It is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote. You have a chance to get out of that. But it can only come through the blood of Jesus Christ and through you turning from that sin. Don't be fooled into believing that you can be a sodomite Christian. There is no such thing. No such thing. That is a grievous sin in God's sight. You saw it there, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And it says there, such were some of you. They weren't continuing in it. I'm warning you. I'm warning you. If you think that world's worst tornado, if you think that that's the end of God's wrath, you haven't seen anything yet. As the sodomite agenda is pushed farther and farther, you're going to see more and more and more evil, more horror coming down on this nation. So, you better repent. You better get right with God. There's not much time left. God's judgment is coming to this nation because of sodomy, along with a lot of other reasons, but mostly because of sodomy. There is nothing that will bring God's wrath and judgment quicker than the sin of Sodom. Nothing. So, we're going to close here with a word of prayer, and then we'll be done. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your word. I Thank you, Lord, that we are not blind down here. We are not walking around as so many people do with religions and traditions of men. Lord, we have your word. We have that written authority, that word that says, let God be true and every man a liar. Lord, I don't care if the majority of people are for sodomy. I don't care. I know what your word says, Lord. And Lord, I'm praying if there's a sodomite young man or a sodomite woman out there, I pray, Lord, that they would think about, not about me, I don't care what they think about me, Lord. I care what they think about your word. And I pray, Lord, that they would understand that your word condemns them to an eternity in hell. And if they don't change their life, if they don't change the direction, the path that they're on, they're going to go to hell and they're going to burn forever. Lord, I pray that you would go out there and convict their hearts and help them to realize their sin before it's too late. Dear Heavenly Father, I just I pray also for protection from these people, these very, very wicked people out there that don't want to repent and that hate preachers like me. Lord, I know that they're going to come after me and they're going to come after my brothers and sisters in Christ here on YouTube. They're going to come after us. They're going to try to put us in jail. They're going to try to stop our mouths from condemning their sin. And Lord, I just pray that you would hold that off as long as possible so that people could get saved so the people could come to know you as their Lord and Savior. And uh, Lord, I realize that I don't know how much time we have left, but in that time, Lord, I pray that all the, my brothers and sisters in Christ would not waste their time with cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, but they would realize the imminent danger that we are all in and that they would work hard, Lord, that they would strive hard to serve you. 
And I just pray all of these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As I stated, if you are a sodomite and you don't, don't know, well, if you are a sodomite, you need to go to my channel page, my main channel page, and watch my salvation message. And you need to forsake that sin of sodomy. You need to get out of that thing. God's wrath is upon you right now. And you have to understand that. You have to understand that God is not okay with your sin. God did not create you to be who you are. You have chosen that sin by your own free will. You cannot continue in that. Okay? Um, if you are saved and you've never messed around with sodomy or things like that, well, we need to fight at this time, point in time, brethren. Not with cruel, harsh words and, and things that will incite people's anger. Uh, you don't need to go around and say faggot and queer and stuff like that. You don't need to use those words. Stick to the Bible. Stick to the King James Bible. The Bible says sodomite. You call them sodomites. And you say, what you're doing is an abomination. That's fine. You're sticking to the Bible. You're using the sword of the Spirit. When you start to depart from the sword of the Spirit, you start to say homosexual, fag, queer, whatever, those, those words. When you start to do that, you're no longer using the sword of the Spirit. You're just using your own mouth. That's dangerous. Very dangerous. Stick to the sword of the Spirit, brethren. And how much time do we have left to be preaching? I don't know. I really don't know. I feel a very great burden uh, here to get this truth out because, honestly, I don't think there's much time left. Okay? Very little time. So, uh, I realize this has been kind of a unique sermon here. I don't normally do sermons at night um, with a fire going beside me. But, uh, like I said, the days have been rainy and things have just been very, very busy. And, uh, you know, doing other studies and things like that. There's just a lot going on right now. So, I... Uh, Appreciate everybody's prayers. Please continue to pray for my wife and I. Um, we're nearing the time where we've been saving up our money and uh, we want to buy a very low cost property. Uh, we want to live debt free. And uh, believe me, it doesn't mean that we're going to be paying $100,000 for a property or something. We're not even going to be paying anywhere even close to that. Uh, the kind of property that we're looking for, we're actually going to be paying less than what most people would pay for a new vehicle. Um, so don't get excited. We're not rich by any means. But uh, we're getting to that point now where it looks like soon we're going to be able to afford a property. We're going to start looking. So I'm not going to be doing as many big studies until we get settled into our new place. And uh, just please pray that the Lord gives us uh, wisdom for this time, that the Lord would open up a property uh, where we can really serve Him. That's our main prayer request right now. So that's going to be it. Uh, again, I know a unique sermon here, um, but it just worked out well this way. Sorry for the distraction of continually getting up and adding more fuel to the fire, but uh, just what I had to do. So that's it. Thank you very much for watching, and thank you very much for your prayers.